The Maximum Entropy Principle We want to build mathematical models to represent information, especially information inside data. But the information that we don't capture within the model, we want to have maximum entropy. Let's look at information versus probability. Probability is based on counting occurrences in n trials as n approaches infinity, whereas in contrast, information is a way of looking at patterns. So a way of looking at the average occurrences of patterns in n trials for very large n. This is very nice for good data, and in particular, that means we're going to use information as the unifying theme for this course. Now, we could probably avoid probability altogether. For instance, we could look at information instead of its function of probability. We could say, well, probability is a function of information. Entropy could be expressed completely in terms of surprisal or self-information. However, in practice, we use probabilities. So we tend to use probability and information. And therefore, we tend to assume big data has random-like properties, even if it's completely non-random simply because we'll be using proportions, relative frequencies, probabilities, uh, at least in the relationship that we have those things to information. So again, suppose we're looking at a sample space of a random experiment. I of x is the self-information from the outcome x and s. And it's the negative log base to the probability. If we have n trials of a random experiment, then outcome x occurs, some count c sub n of x times an n trials. Each occurrence produces i of x bits of information. And so now we can actually figure out what the information is for this experiment. We simply take the average information of the random variable associated with s as n approaches infinity. So the entropy is the average, the number of times each x occurs uh, is c sub n of x, and then we have also uh, the information for each occurrence of x. And when we take that limit, then we end up with the sum of the probabilities times the information. So to put it all together, in terms of either information or probabilities, we have the following theorem. If a random process occurs and produces m outcomes with the associated probabilities p1 to pm, and if x is a variable associated with the process, then the Shannon entropy of capital X is the average uh, or the expected value of the information, and where the self-information is the negative log 2 uh, of the probability, the base 2 logarithm of the probability. So let's look at what we have so far. We have entropy, a couple of different notations. Entropy is an average over all possible values of the variable, capital X, associated with our space. And to keep this straight, the self-information is a function of little x. It's the information due to capital X having a specific value, little x. So let me mention zero probabilities. Uh, the limit as p goes to zero from the right of p log base 2 of p is zero. So if we have a zero probability, then we set that to zero. Or we could simply define the Shannon entropy to, to be the average over events with non-zero probabilities. Either way you want to look at it, it's fine. Now let's look at entropy and independence. If x and y are independent over a sample space, then the entropy is given by this double sum because we have probabilities of both x and y, outcomes indexed by x and y, and information is x and y, so we have the double sum. And if we have independence, then the surprisal, uh, joint surprisal, uh, i x comma y is equal to the sum of the surprisals of the individual x and y. And then we can split that into two sums. 
once we have those two sums, we can group so that we're taking some sum of the probabilities. And notice that summing over the y's gives us the marginal probability for x. And likewise for x, we get the marginal probability for y. So we get p of x, i of x, p of y, i of y. And that's just the sum of the entropies. So if we have independent variables, then the entropy, the joint entropy of x and y, is equal to the sum of the entropies. So if x and y are independent, then their joint entropy is the sum of their individual entropies. In general, the sum of the individual entropies is only an upper bound. And this generalizes quickly to, or easily to more than two variables. Notice that that means that the entropy of simultaneous independent trials is greater than each trial. So in other words, if we do an experiment more than once, then we'll have more entropy than if we just did the experiment once if the outcomes of the trials are independent. If we have only two independent variables, then there's no relationship to model. So we can't get any information from y by asking you know, how it depends on x. So if we had a pattern in the data, and we only had two variables, then x and y would be independent, and there's therefore no big data there. We only have uh, patterns due to a single variable. And the same idea, of course, holds for any number of variables. So if we want meaningful patterns, we need dependence among the individual features. And this is a very important idea because suppose we did some large number of independent trials of the same experiment. The entropies for the uh, independent trials would all be the same. And therefore, we would have an upper bound of uh, n h of x1 uh, for the joint entropy. And what we mean by that is that as we increase the number of independent trials, the number, the amount of entropy tends to increase, tends to go to infinity. If we have complex data, which is many, many independent variables, then we necessarily have very high entropy because of the idea that we saw above. In other words, we expect disorder. We expect a, a lot of uncertainty. Patterns, however, have relatively low entropy. So the maximum entropy principle says that the best model is the one that allows the most uncertainty from the data. In other words, a probability distribution should assign an unbiased, non-zero probability to every event not excluded by the given information. Information drives modeling. That's what we're getting at. So intuitively, anything we can't explain is assigned as much uncertainty as possible. Or, as we said at the very beginning, we model as much as we can the information that's within a data set or in a, coming from a process that produces a data set. But anything we can explain, we want it to be as uncertain as possible. So let's look at an example. If we've got two outcomes, then the probability of one outcome will be p, and the probability of the other be 1 minus p. The entropy would be negative p log base 2 of p minus 1 minus p log base 2 of 1 minus p. As a function of p, the entropy is maximized when p equals a half. And you can see that here. Here's the actual entropy as a function of p, and when p is equal to a half, a an experiment with only two possible outcomes has maximum entropy. So in some sense a fair coin is the most random process with two outcomes, i.e. the one with maximum entropy. If we have three outcomes, and we're going to say these three outcomes are red, green, and blue, then p is the probability of red, q is the probability of green, so the probability of blue is 1 minus p minus q. And that gives us an entropy of negative p log base 2 of p minus q log base 2 of q minus 1 minus p minus q log base 2 of 
1 minus b minus q. And here we can actually see the surface that corresponds to that entropy. And you can see that it has a maximum at p equals a third and q equals a third. So therefore, with a maximum at a third, a third, then that means that if we know nothing about the process, except that there are three possible outcomes, the least biased model is the one that assigns a probability of third to each of the outcomes. So suppose that it's known, uh, we've measured, estimated, somehow we figured out that the probability of green is actually a half. In other words, Q is equal to a half. Then if all we know is that the probability of green is a half, then intuitively we know that the least biased model assigns a fourth as the probability to the other outcomes. And this is in fact the model that we would get if we use the maximum entropy principle. As we're now going to illustrate. So here is the entropy when Q is equal to a half. So we've replaced the uh, Q by a half, as you can see here. The derivative, we have to recall our derivative rules and our properties of the base 2 logarithm. And here's our derivative. So we use the product rule, and that gave us the log base 2 of P, because the derivative of P is 1, so that's the log base 2 of P and then minus p times the derivative of log base 2 of p, which is p log 2, and similarly. And notice that the middle terms, the uh, numerator and denominator, have a common factor that cancels, and then the two are the negatives of each other. So it simplifies to this expression. So that means the derivative is given by this expression. And the derivative is therefore 0 only if the log base 2 of p is the log base 2 of a half minus p, which is p equals a half minus p, which is p equals a fourth. The second derivative is less than 0 for 0 less than p less than a half. So by the second derivative test, we have a maximum of h when p is equal to a fourth. So the maximum entropy principle features maximum uncertainty for those parts of the process which are unknown. In our example, the maximum for P is a fourth. So if it's known that the probability of green is a half, but that's all that's known, then the unknown should be as unbiased as possible. So we'll use information entropy often to classify patterns. It can even tell us when there are no patterns. So we'll also be using probability. We've used it already. And in general, if we have a measure that's between 0 and 1, we likely are going to call it a probability. It's actually a proportion. Uh, if it doesn't have units, it certainly can be interpreted as a percentage or a proportion. So when we're using the concept of probability, remember, our true goal is information. Let's just mention that we could explore information even more deeply using the concept of symmetry. So for instance, a complete graph is completely symmetric. So in general, the most symmetric graph is a disjoint union of complete graphs. Anything else has less symmetry. And the clustering coefficient, remember, is 1. We can think of that as a probability. And therefore, when we have a clustering coefficient of 1, then we have, in essence, no information. So we have full symmetry, absolutely no surprises. All the edges are there, so we're not surprised uh, that, that we find an edge between any two vertices. So we will use this concept, but not rigorously. But it can actually help us when we use symmetry. So looking forward, entropy allows us to search for patterns. We can measure average information from a collection of patterns or performance of an algorithm uh, using entropy. There's also going to be false positives and false negatives. We'll also need metrics to measure performance and other issues. And this is actually lecture 2.1.
number six.